So for the first time, many of my friends are starting to ask me these snarky questions like, okay, Mr. Negotiation Professor, do you have any tips for negotiating with my crazy teenager? Well, today, that's what I'm gonna talk about. If you feel like your teenager is completely impervious to anything you say, and that you are absolutely powerless to get them to do homework or chores or, or even respond to you with more than an eye roll or a grunt, well, then this video is for you. Today, I'm going to unpack three typical errors that parents make when trying to negotiate with their teenager, and I will replace them with four useful tips to increase the likelihood that you will actually succeed in the communication with your teenager. So, common error number one is to avoid power contests. So, what do I mean by that? So, up until this point in your relationship with your child, it's been pretty clear that you are the parent with the power and they are the child and they are really tasked with more or less doing what you say and they're very reliant on you. And I completely appreciate from a negotiation perspective why you would want to retain that power. After all, we know that there is research that says that in any negotiation, people suffer from what's called loss aversion. So if you have something, the idea of losing it feels particularly dramatic. And framing this negotiation as a power contest with your child means that there's something that you're gonna lose. But here's the other concern about framing something as a power contest. When your child becomes a teenager, they get this new and very important interest, which is to explore their own independence and to have a sense of autonomy. Now autonomy, is an interest that all humans being have, but teenagers have it in a very special way. What do I mean by autonomy? It's the sense that they can make some own decisions about their own life and their own choices. And so when you frame a negotiation in terms of threats and consequences, those will be experienced by your teenager as threats on their autonomy. And so they are not persuasive they actually will cause the teenager to dig in more. It sets up an unnecessary competition and fails to meet one of their most key interests in this part of their life. And perhaps most importantly, it destroys trust. So even if you get compliance using threats and power, it comes at an incredibly high cost. Okay, second error to avoid is making classic comparisons. So, this is gonna be a little counterintuitive because if you watch my videos, I constantly talk about how valuable objective criteria are in negotiation. That is, how helpful it is to look to outside standards of legitimacy to support or betress or to support or lend a hand to your argument. So here I am saying avoid classic comparisons. Well, why is this? And what do I mean by classic comparisons? So the kinds of classic comparisons that are completely unhelpful are, one, citing what some other friend of your child's is doing, or citing what some other parent of a friend of your child's is expecting. Usually this falls completely flat. Secondly, another second comparison that usually doesn't work is saying what was expected of you when you were growing up. Now it is fine if what was expected of you is an internal barometer of what you expect from your kids. But when you cite that, it tends to have no resonance with your kids at all. And really good negotiators really think about not what is persuasive to themselves, but what would be persuasive to the other side. And hearing comparisons about other friends or when you were a kid tend to actually not work. So the third classic error to avoid is engaging in quid pro quo bargaining. Okay, I know this may sound confusing too since you're all watching a station about negotiation. So I wanna be clear about the difference between quid pro quo bargaining and negotiation, right? A negotiation, as a reminder, is a communication with an intention to influence or persuade someone. And so if you're trying to get your kid to pay more attention to their studies, 
or to spend less time on their phone or to do their chores. You are trying to influence or persuade their choice. Bargaining is something different. Bargaining is a back and forth exchange of concessions that is marked by haggling. So what is wrong with quid pro quo bargaining? In quid pro quo bargaining, usually you're saying, if you do X, then I will let you do Y. So for example, if you go to your grandma's on Sunday, then you could stay out later on Friday night. Or if you make honor roll, you'll get tickets to the Taylor Swift concert. The problem with this is that it sets up a set of incentives for really smart teens to exploit. And I have seen this happen in all sorts of contexts. Probably the one I'm most familiar with is internal to my own family. So let me give you an example. When I was growing up, my parents did not use quid pro quo bargaining. However, uh, some of my best friend's parents did. And let me just tell you, basically my friends learned how to game the entire situation. Of course they would swear me to secrecy, right? But they would literally say, okay, I want, and it wasn't Taylor Swift back then, right? It might be like Madonna tickets or Cyndi Lauper tickets or Duran Duran tickets, right? Um, and they would set up this elaborate set of no, 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 I won't do this, this, this. But then they would say, but I will be doing to this if I get those Duran Duran tickets or if I can go to the shore for the weekend. And so what you end up with is setting up this incentive scheme that is never ending, isn't building any trust, and is totally exhausting. So if these are things not to do, what are the four things that are helpful for negotiating with your teen? First, recognize and acknowledge your teen's new interest in autonomy and independence. Now, I want to be clear. This does not mean giving in to their demands but it does involve framing issues in ways that give them some real decision-making power about their activities and how they'll spend their time and how they'll make decisions. And if you honor that autonomy, that will be seen and acknowledged. Second, create a regular routine around decision-making and planning in your family. Now, in negotiation, we call this negotiating process. So, what this will look like for a family is perhaps setting up a time once a week, maybe on Sunday evening, for everyone to get together, share a little bit about what's going on in their lives, what the week ahead looks like for them, what they hope to do, and what their interests are. During this time, you too share your interests, and you do it in a firm and a confident way. You also demonstrate really good listening for your kids. You acknowledge your interests and concerns. You don't downplay them. You don't tell them why it's a bad idea. You don't judge them. But then you state your interests and theirs, and you invite joint problem solving. What is the way that we're going to enable you to go to the party on Friday, go to the football game on Saturday, do whatever you want to do on Sunday, and also get your chores done and your homework done and see grandma? And together you brainstorm. Third, Inevitably, because you have a teenager and they're human, there are going to be infractions. And so having a strategy on how to deal with them is really important. When there is an infraction, it's important to raise it, but to raise it in a way that avoids shaming, but also that doesn't pretend that something that was agreed to hasn't happened. So the way you do this is share the behavior you observed Share how it did not comport with the understanding or expectation you had for their behavior, and then share how this infraction made you feel. Secondly, ask them for their view of the situation. The goal here is not to get them to agree to your view or vice versa. Just you want to show that you're interested in their own thought process and what happened for them. In the instances where your teen agrees and owns up to it, accept their apology, and then ask them what they plan to do moving forward to reduce the likelihood this will happen again. Again, do this as an open-ended question and let them generate the answer. Because an answer that's generated from them is one that they're much more likely to own and want to live up to. Now, let's imagine your teen does not agree that they have failed to do something. This is not a moment to get into a fight about who is right and who is wrong. Instead, simply say something like, you know, 
It's clear we don't see eye to eye in this. And so we're going to have to find a way of handling this going forward that works for both of us. What ideas do you have? Again, giving them the chance to offer the ideas. Now, let's imagine that your teen still refuses to engage, right? They are just looking at their screen. In that case, remind them of how you really, really want to treat them as an adult, but that you also have a responsibility to be their parent, and then ask them for advice on how you can do that. If you're still getting the silent treatment, you're still being intransigent, do not escalate. Escalation will not work in this situation. It will just make your relationship with your teenager worse. On the other hand, you can't just drop the issue either because if you do, then you're rewarding bad behavior. So ask them for another time before the end of the day when you can have another conversation about this issue. And if they don't agree to that, then make sure that you raise it again either at the family meeting or some other time. Truth of the matter is, negotiating with teens is really, really hard. But there are some things you could do to increase the likelihood that you'll get some compliance, that you'll preserve the relationship with your teenager, and that you'll build trust. First of these is recognize your teen's newfound interests in autonomy and independence. Second, create a regular routine around decision-making and planning in the family. Third, when there are infractions, raise those infractions in a way that avoid shaming and that invite joint problem solving. Lastly, if your teen is still being intransigent, avoid escalation. You should not drop the issue, but ask them for some time before the end of the day or maybe in the next week when this conversation can be had in a constructive way. So parents, I suspect some of you are still thinking, oh my gosh, this is helpful but not enough because I feel like my teen has all the power. In that case, keep watching this next video, which is how do I negotiate when the other side has more power? Also, if you're new to my channel, I'd be really grateful if you would subscribe to it. It's filled with literally hundreds of videos on how to improve your negotiation and communication skills. Don't forget to like this video and also ring the bell so you'll never miss a new video when I drop it. Okay, you know you want to watch the next video, maybe with your teen. Keep watching, click, click.